Hey, Sandra, I know you're running a race this weekend. How's training going? It's been awesome, Scott. Thanks to our friends at Audible, I get to read while I run. That's amazing. Can we share this with our Genre Junkies listeners? We sure can. Genre Junkies get a free audiobook and 30-day trial at audibletrial.com forward slash genre. Weirdo bookworms unite! We want to share our love of genre fiction with you. Fans of horror, sci-fi, fantasy, and more can stop by as we chat about what we've been reading. Hello, genre junkies, and thank you for joining us for sci-fi tonight. (laughs) That sounds like a news story. I'm sorry, but thank you for being here, and it is sci-fi night. Tonight on sci-fi tonight. Exactly! As always, I'm Sandra. Like entertainment tonight? No. No, no, it's good. From the (laughs) 90s. I'm Sandra. I'm Scott. And tonight, we're going to talk about a sci-fi book, um, Head On, by John Scalzi. That's right. I wanted to read another Scalzi book. It's a little bit earlier than I had anticipated, but here we are. Yes. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But before we do... I wanted to let you guys in on something really exciting that I did this uh, past weekend. Do tell. Um, I went and saw a fun private screening party, if you will, put on by Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. Went with friend of the show, Jen, uh, to see A Quiet Place, that new horror movie that's out in theaters right now. And did you love it? I really did love it. I did. I know there's a lot of hype going on for it right now, and that's always really dangerous with books or with movies, but I will say that I thought it was really solid. It was it hit a lot of check marks for me that I love in a good horror movie. There's definitely a sci-fi element to it, which um is kind of relevant to our discussion tonight. It's uh, just a great genre film. I think it's going to have mass appeal. I think people are really going to dig it. I really dug it. I had so much fun at the screener party, too. We played an audience participation game. I was one of the brave souls that like went to the front and participated. We did horror trivia, at which um, I answered way too many questions. And so I got a lot of prizes, but then they were like calling on people who weren't me. She left that theater with her arms just full of stuff. Yeah, I got graphic novels, I got a keychain, I got a pin, I got a lanyard. Uh, There was other stuff that they had there that I wanted to win that I didn't get as a prize. So it's going to keep me going back, and I hope they do a lot more of these screeners. Um, Super fun night, super fun movie. I hope you guys get a chance to check it out. I can't wait to watch it myself. I'm really bummed I didn't go with you. What were you doing instead, Scott? I was playing a Splatfest (laughs) on Splatoon 2. Uh, Scott is a huge Splatoon fan. Does anybody else out there play Splatoon? Just let us know. Scott will be your friend and play with you. I'll throw you my friend code. <laughs> not not here on the show, though. No, no. Um, would you say that Splatoon is genre? No. It's not science fiction? Well, I, oh, actually, it is post-apocalyptic science fiction, yeah. It's just also really adorable. It is. It's really fun and it's really cute, yeah. <laughs> All right. So as we mentioned, we recently did John Scalzi, our first John Scalzi experience, and Scott enjoyed it more than I did, but we both found it not quite up to what we were hoping John Scalzi would deliver for us. He's such a popular author, and something about the collapsing empire just didn't fit with the popularity that he has. I was expecting something so much bigger or something, I don't know, denser, crazier. I don't know. So we decided to give John Scalzi another try, and we were able to get an ARC, um, advanced reader copy of his new book, Head On, which comes out, oh my gosh, like within days of this episode being released. Yeah, I think if you're listening to this episode as it comes out, it's coming out this weekend. Yeah, perfect. Um, And I've... Of course, as always, we will keep the first section spoiler free. We'll warn you after the break that we're going to talk spoilers. But um, this is kind of our John Scalzi revisited 2.0 experience. Scott. Sandra. (laughs) Could you please give us a synopsis of this book? I am going to give it a synopsis, and I'm going to tell you right now that I am cheating. I think that the synopsis for this book that's already printed by the publisher is perfect and immediately hooked me, and so I'm going to steal straight from that. 
Hilketa is a frenetic and violent pastime where players attack each other with swords and hammers. The main goal of the game? Obtain your opponent's head and carry it through the goalposts. With flesh and bone bodies, a sport like this would be impossible, but all the players are threeps. Robot-like bodies controlled by people with Hayden syndrome, so anything goes. No one gets hurt, but the brutality is real and the crowds love it. Until a star athlete drops dead on the playing field. That is um, a very good description of the book. Pretty perfect. It, it is perfect, and it got me just right away. When I read the synopses for this, I was definitely excited. I will say that the players are able to sense some pain, though, because they're neurologically connected. That's right. They they It's toned down quite a bit. They don't mm. feel pain like your head is being ripped off, but they do feel the pain to stay on their toes, to stay... To, to have a competitive edge. So Scott, why don't you explain to people what Hayden syndrome is in this universe that John Scalzi has created? So I haven't read the first book in this world. It's not a series. This it's a standalone. A this is a standalone book. But uh, people who have Hayden syndrome, they are completely paralyzed, more than quadriplegic. They are just completely comatose, but their brains are completely active. And so- in this near future world, there was a government initiative to create these neural networks for these people who suffered from Hayden syndrome so that they could interface with these robots called Threeps and still live out full lives. They also have access to kind of a virtual reality alternate world that they can all hang out in. Okay, so that's Hayden's. Um, such a cool, cool concept. And I think that's one of the things that really roped me in was this idea. So we're going to talk a little bit more about Hayden's. But first... Our patented experience score. Absolutely. So for me, um, this was a little bit of John Scalzi redeemed. And I don't really mean that because I didn't hate the first book I read for, from him. But this one, uh, the plot was just so much more engaging for me. I loved his characters and his writing in the first book I read from him, from The Collapsing Empire. But this book just really engaged me a lot more. And that was 100% the plot. I would say this was a good read for me. I enjoyed it. I wasn't crazy about it. But I liked the characters, I loved the dialogue, and I enjoyed the story. Uh, I could see how this could be a page-turner for many, but for me, it was just a nice, solid, good read, and I'm so happy that my second John Scalzi experience was such a positive one. Well, for me, Head On was a really fun page-turner. Ah, see? I knew it. Page-turner for some. It has a really interesting near future setting. It has really exciting mystery and cracking dialogue. Yes. The characters are just a lot of fun. It definitely has a really strong procedural mystery element, uh, complete with character discussion of CSI-like investigations, but um, it's done in an interesting way that still manages to maintain a snappy pace even with all of that. It's it's. I just, I couldn't put the book down. I think that's so cool that this was a page turner for you. So you enjoyed your second John Scalzi experience more as well. Oh, very much. Yeah. Um, One thing I want to touch on a little bit before the spoiler sections is uh, the concept of Hayden's. Um, I love this concept. I call this super approachable science fiction because like you said, it's very near future. I mean, honestly, there's not enough like crazy bells and whistles going on that this couldn't be happening right now in 2018 in this world we live in. But I loved that people who have a disease, who are marginalized, have such a wonderful sense of agency that they, instead of being in times past and in books past where they would be just completely immobile, they are able to live lives. They get married. They have jobs. It can be really hard because it can be very expensive to be a, a Hayden, which they talk about, which is really important in sort of a sociopolitical standpoint that's relevant to things for us in our world now. But um, I love that these people had agency. And they talk about how Hilkata, this game, is really important for a lot of Haydens because only Haydens play this game. It's a huge national sport. It's like getting up there in football level. And it's trying to breach out of North America. And it's all played by the people who are living with this disease. And I thought that was so cool. And you talk about in the book that 
a lot of people don't like Hadens. They're uncomfortable around them because they are essentially robots walking around very humanoid robots. He leaves, um, in this book anyway, he leaves the description of them kind of up to your own interpretation. I had a little bit of a hard time picturing the threeps that they walk around in. And I like to think that stands for C-3PO, but I don't know. I had a little bit of a hard time picturing them, but it was interesting how some people are uncomfortable with them. When it's really, it's totally a person, quote unquote, in there. They're just able to move through the world, live life like able-bodied people. Super cool stuff, John Scalzi. I went back and forth on picturing them. I went from kind of an uncanny valley yeah, which approach. I think is what makes some people uncomfortable. Right. And and I also really heavily pictured the robots in Penny Arcade's Automata, which if you haven't read it, is a cool little short story by them. But because he does not describe them very well, it, you really can create whatever cool or unnerving picture in your head that you want. One thing that I um, kind of pictured as I was reading the book is that they would have just totally normal human voices. <laughs> But I don't know if that's true. But that's just how I heard them speaking in my head. Something that's really cool, our our hero, our lead character, Chris, he's also a person of color. His parents are described as being African-American. And so obviously his body is too. I thought that was awesome. It was like double representation for people. There really is a lot of strong representation in this book, more than even a lot of the books that we normally talk about, because it really goes in depth on some of those. Super cool, and it adds a whole other element to this really relatable science fiction world and book. So on that note, um, can we talk about Chris a little bit? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the characters. So Chris Shane is our hero, so to speak. He's an FBI agent. He is a Hayden, so he goes through the world in a threep. He's very well-respected. He was kind of a celebrity. He was kind of the poster child for Hayden's. For most of his life, um, his dad is a super famous, successful NBA player. I adored Chris. I thought he was so funny. He's super smart. And there's nothing pathetic about him. There's no self-pity. There's no self-loathing. He's just very acceptant of being a person with Hayden's who needs to use a threep. And I really dug that. It just... You can tell that he doesn't think of himself as anything different, and nor should he. And it's unfortunate that people think of people with Hayden's so differently in this book, because it's like, no, really, they're totally just normal people. They just have to use this, like, third-party body. What I like about Chris so much is he's just very blasé about the whole thing. I mean, he's very funny. He's hilarious, really. But when it comes to being Hayden, he's just very chill about the whole thing. He's very accepting of it. Just like you said, it's it's not that big of a deal for him. And in some ways, his personal privilege when it comes to being okay with it actually helps inform you, the reader, as far as what other Hayden's troubles are, because he recognizes them and learns about them as a somewhat privileged Hayden himself. Kind of the fact that he's an FBI agent is really telling about threeps as, you know, how they operate. They're not like a herky-jerky, creaky robot. I mean, obviously, you're controlling it with your brain, so it's just like your own body, like as far as your reaction times and stuff go. I mean, he's <laughs> he's a federal agent. He carries a gun. He can operate a car. Like, they can do a lot of stuff that's not like the standard, like, I am a robot, and I am so stiff in my movements. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that makes you like really as the reader accepting that oh Haydens are just totally people they just kind of have different hardware well and while their threeps are built to specifications to mimic human abilities and strength and things like that they they have kind of an elevated level of awareness because of all of the things that come with being in a robot body they can process information faster they actually have overlays over things that they see totally they aren't stuck to one body they can jump from body to body cool concept right there too it's all through your neural network which is super super cool and then there's some people that don't use threeps they talk about that they just kind of live out their lives in kind of the internet like alternate reality yeah yeah 
Um, really briefly, without going into too much details, some minor characters in this book are um, Chris's parents. Like I said, his dad was in the NBA. His parents are these incredibly smart, savvy business people who, even though they obviously had a lot of money like in Chris's upbringing, they did not want him to be privileged or bratty. They're very funny themselves. They seem super cool, like totally those dream parents you'd love to have. They have really loving, great interactions with him, even though he's a grown-ass adult man. It's just really sweet, like a really nice family unit that he can kind of come back to and like bounce his ideas off of about the case. I thought that was really sweet, especially since he is an adult, that he has such a cool relationship with his family. I love his mom in particular because there still is those, I mean, this is very near future, so there are biases. She is not considered to be as smart or as powerful or people don't really know who she is as much as her famous, rich, former NBA player husband, but she's so smart. One of the things about this book is all of the characters are just very smart. Yes. Uh, Scalzi uses that to his benefit by creating really witty and sharp dialogue. And he's he's just uh, he is just unapologetic in creating intelligent characters. That's such a great way to put it. I totally agree. And, and speaking of smart, Leslie Van, who is Chris Shane's partner in the FBI, she is a average able bodied lady. She is completely hilarious. She's caustic. She's kind of un PC. She's kick ass. And like, she's kind of like the volatile one. And Chris is kind of the plays the straight man to her in a lot of ways, because she's always like making people angry and kind of speaking out of turn or saying something really outrageous. That's like, oh, my God, lady, I loved her. And I loved her for that. And I loved their dynamic together. Uh, She's so comfortable and so totally chill with her partner being a Hayden. There's no tension between the two of them. They've been partners for like a little over a year. So they're still a little bit in the getting to know you phase, which is fun to see in their relationship, too. It's kind of like the early seasons of SVU. She And she's the Elliot. She's the Elliot. She's the one who's kind of on a razor wire. The stabler. Yeah, right. And I really love that she was written to be like that. I, I love strong, caustic women in books. And she's so smart. I mean, really, she puts Chris in his place so many times throughout this book because she's, first of all, she is the senior officer, but she's also just really good at her job despite being, she's just completely unfiltered. I'm so glad we agree. Yeah, two really strong lead characters. I don't want to talk too much about a lot of other characters in there because it gets into more the nuts and bolts of the story, which could be a little spoilery. But another group I loved reading about was Chris's flatmates. His flatmates remind me a lot of the lone gunmen. They're the guys kind of off to the sidelines, but they all have their own little specialties. They're all kind of smart about different things. And while he's an FBI agent and can't really bring them in on everything, it's really cool to his dynamic with them and getting help from them on this case. Uh, Yeah, I totally agree. And I really appreciate the X-Files reference therein. I thought they were really fun. They're and they're more smart, funny characters to banter and bounce off with. Uh, really cute. I I really looked forward to the scenes of him being in his flat with his flatmates and all of their dynamic together and their sense of community without being cheesy. And I can't say this enough. His dialogue is so spectacular in this book. Oh my god, it was my favorite part of the first book I read from him. The the characters and the dialogue. And this is even better. He kind of reminds me of Aaron Sorkin in that really quick, snappy dialogue that's witty and smart. I totally agree. Aaron Sorkin's walkie-talkies, of which Amanda, friend of the show, is a huge, huge fan. So Amanda, I think you should read some John Scalzi if you haven't yet. We're coming for you. (laughs) So before we go into the spoiler section, I wanted to talk about our appeal score for this book. Um, I'll kick us off. For me... I feel very confident putting this as a general appeal. It's very approachable sci-fi, as I said before. It's an FBI procedural, which I think a lot of people are very comfortable with that, especially if you've read lots of mysteries and thrillers. The skeleton is just there, kind of in that procedural world. So I think if you're kind of 
new to sci-fi or you want to dip your toes in it, this could be a good place. And if you're dyed in the wool sci-fi, I think that the concepts and the sociopolitical stuff going on in this book will really appeal to you. And there's some great laugh out loud moments. And I think in general, most people can appreciate that humor. I'm going to go out on a rare limb, and I'm actually giving this broad appeal. Ooh, that's fantastic. As a procedural mystery alone, this book is on point. If you're a fan of CSI or Law and Order or books by um, James Patterson or Michael Connolly, this is right up there with that, in my opinion. Uh, the sci-fi conceit of Head On is a little convoluted if you don't already have a grounding in robot and mech slash fiction. Uh so it might prove a little bit too out there for non-genre readers, but but really, I think it's really well explained. I think the writing is so good. I really think that this could have broad appeal. All right. Well, there you have it, guys. That's going to wrap up our spoiler-free section. Let's take a quick break and come back and talk spoilers. Enjoying the show? Please like and subscribe on iTunes. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Genre Junkies. And don't forget to visit the website, genrejunkies.com. Welcome to the spoiler section. That's right. I jumped you. We said next time we did sci-fi, I was going to jump you on it. It's the spoiler section. Very nice. Just like Frogger. So let's talk about spoilers in this book. Um... Right off the bat, I'm going to play a little bit of a card here. I'm going to be a little bit of a uh, devil's advocate, I guess. I'm going to use a little bit of my snobbery. Okay, I'm very worried. So here's the thing. Like many of us out there, um, I've read so, so many mysteries and thrillers. I mean, obviously, this podcast focus on genre, but I've spent a huge chunk of my life marinating in the mystery and thriller world. I was raised from a very young age on PBS BBC Mystery. I know you were too, Scott. And Angela Lansbury clacking away on that Murder, She Wrote typewriter and Columbo and all of that. So I am a little picky when it comes to my mystery thriller, which is one reason I'm glad that this is not a mystery thriller podcast, because that could get really dangerous. But here's my thing. I like my mysteries to have a little bit more high stakes, a little bit more of a sinister edge. And for me, this didn't have enough of that until, you know, flat out Chris's apartment was attacked to go after Donut. By the way, shout out to Donut, a wonderful cat character, which I was thrilled to have. Um, And it's not like this mystery in the book is convoluted or doesn't make sense or wasn't fun to read. But I wanted a little bit more bite, a little bit more edge to the mystery part of this. I admit this is a little bit of a corporate mystery. Yes, it's which, like a white collar mystery, which, like Collapsing Empire, was not your favorite part of Scalzi's writing. I I get the feeling that Scalzi really does have a business background, at least based on the two books that we've read by him, which really scratches an itch for me, which is why I love it so much. That explains the look you gave me when I was comparing him to James Patterson. Yes, and I'm not saying James Patterson is the end all be all, but at least I don't know James. Patterson's mystery thrillers have a little bit more of that kind of sinister evilness, which I appreciate. Whereas this is like, yeah, it's like white collar crime. Not exactly. I mean, that nah, people still get murdered in this book. A lot of people get murdered. Which I appreciate. I, you do need a body count in this sort of thing. One of the things about the, well, obviously the, the killer, one of the things that the killer really kind of messed up with is she kept killing suspects. Yes. So at the end of the day, there's really not a whole lot left after they're all after all the witnesses are dead because they were all suspects and now they're dying. So clearly they weren't the ones guilty. Maybe you should have thought that through a little bit before you started killing everybody. Did you figure it out who the killer was? I no, I didn't. I had a theory. I wasn't surprised, but I didn't have it figured out. I thought that I would before it 
before it got to the end, but I didn't. That's okay. Um, So I did see that it was going to be Amelie as the one that did it, but that's not to say that it was baseless getting there or anything. It's just, as you said, as she started killing off people who I was thinking it was going to be, it was like, well, you're kind of like the last person left standing who I was suspecting. So yeah, sorry, lady, you're going to prison. Amelie was definitely on my short list of suspects, but I kind of thought it was going to be Kim in the end. She was on my suspect list. She just seemed too nice and too helpful. Yeah. It was just a little suspicious to me. And I wouldn't. She was probably the top of my list mm-hmm. uh, for, Lena, most, for most of the book anyway. Lena was on my list. Um, uh, Dwayne's wife was on my list. So I liked that. I like when there's a lot of suspects. That does make for a good mystery. Can I just say how excited I was that Leslie Van was not guilty of something? (laughs) I'm just so used to these twists of the good guy, friendly person is really the bad guy in the end. And, And I recognize that this is kind of a book in a world and she is a recurring character in the world. But I'm just kind of trained to expect that twist. So it was refreshing to me. Uh, Oh, yeah. I mean, it would have been completely ludicrous for Leslie Van to have been in any way involved in (laughs) any murders and uh, the crime going on here. I also, as much as I love a good OTP and I love a good romance, I like that I'm not picking up any tension between Van and Chris. Are you? No, I don't pick up any. It's not a thing. And I'm sure fans of this world are are very likely to put the two together. I like that they're just kind of friends. They're co-workers. They, I well, they're, they're partners, and which right. is more than a co-worker relationship, I, uh, which I get. Yeah, they are truly partners. And any tension that exists is actually put out there by Chris's parents because they clearly like her very much. But there isn't a tension between the two of them. That's not a, well, again, they're like Stabler and Benson. They're partners. They may get very close. They may be be very they may really end up eventually in this world being like family but they're not they're not destined to be in a relationship well and if they do end up being together i feel like like in some later book if he decides to keep going with these two characters as leads i feel like it'll be okay like it'll be organic them getting together and it's not like some weird star-crossed it's fated that they're going to be together thing um I really do want to say that I appreciated the character of Amelie. Uh, I thought she was really well written. I thought she was very interesting. I think she was a good, I don't know, foil for Chris. They had some good scenes together, some good dialogue. I agree, because again, she's a very smart character. We say that about everybody in this book, but she's really intelligent. Yeah. And I like the twist, not the twist, but the reality that those who are afflicted with Hayden's syndrome are no better or worse than people who aren't. They're humans. They suffer from the same positives and negatives that anyone else in the world does. They're criminals, they're saints, they're they're everything in between. Right, exactly. This isn't a novel of people who are living with a disease are somehow angelical Christ-like figures. (laughs) Like, they're just normal. Uh, Really quickly, I because I am a crazy cat lady, I do want to go back to Donut. Donut. Wonderful cat. Donut's a wonderful cat, and I'm really sad that they had to give Donut back. Oh my god, the twins especially. Well, I mean, in the end, everybody wanted to keep Donut. How cool are the twins? Yes. See, I want to read the first book now, and I want to read it because of the twins. I think that mm-hmm. is such an interesting concept of two people being so close, like twins can sometimes be, especially when they've when they're both afflicted with Hayden's and can't move, controlling the same body, controlling the same avatar, being kind of one person. Well, I mean, and they could definitely step out if they wanted to be, but for the purposes of just chilling at home in the flat, for economic reasons, they may as well just share the same body because you can always rent a threep and you can have your own space in the virtual reality. Um, But I thought it was funny because like, there was times where Chris says he doesn't know which one of them is talking <laughs> because they're in the same, as you said, uh, avatar, robotic body, I guess. So this is kind of... I don't want to say it's gross, because I'm trying to be very mature here, but I am 14. Um, I'm not really 14. 
I'm mentally 14. But I spiritually 14. Yes, only with a lot of responsibilities. But I liked addressing Hayden's sexuality. I thought that was very important because it helped solidify and cement and remind the people in this world and also us as the readers that people with Hayden's are people. And since they can experience physical sensations because their brains are operating, they can have romantic, intimate, um, sexual relationships with others. And that's a huge important part of this book because Dwayne is having uh, well, at least one affair that's really solid, but he married a non-Hayden woman and there's nothing weird about that. It's not like she married some robot that, you know, can't make its own decisions. She married a person who has to go through the world in this body. I don't know. I just really, from a study of human sexuality standpoint, I super appreciated that, that if a Hayden, just like any person, could be non-binary, they can be homoerotic, they can be heterosexual, they can be whatever they are. I'm glad that you brought that up because I think you're right. It is important that the, he explored the sexuality of Hayden's. But I did feel that it was a little bit too much of kink shaming when it came to all of the different threeps that he had. But there were, but, definitely, but remember, char- there were definitely characters that did a great job, specifically the manufacturer of those threeps. They did a good job of explaining, hey, you know, they're humans just like everyone else. They have needs. But but hold on. I, I do want to disagree there a little bit because remember when Chris walks into Dwayne's apartment and he sees there's um a female genital, a male genital, and a unknown genital three. <laughs> let's just ridges. say ridges. There's ridges. And he says, I'm not judging. Like he does say that. Chris does say that. But yeah, I mean, of course, like the maker of those um prototypes that Dwayne was testing out, he is like totally open to people with non-Hayden's getting into this market because he's like, hey, people want to try some different stuff and I want to feel that niche for them. I appreciate that one of the first things that he said was, I'm not judging, but then they continued to go on for quite a few pages, then doing a lot of judging. The characters did. Now, I'm going to give Scalzi a little bit of a pass because a lot of the characters, a lot of the book is very irreverent. Yeah. And kind of makes fun of a lot of different things as a way to kind of explain how they work. So I'm giving them a little bit of a pass, but it was a little dangerously close to kink shaming, I feel. Well, I guess maybe that's a way to look at it as being very relevant and very like our world we live in now. Some people are just totally down and you do you, boo, and you live how you you got to live your truth. And then other people are a little bit more like, whoa, what's going on here? Maybe that's just a good way to look at it. It's very true to life. Okay, I can agree with that, yeah. So I'm very proud to say that I would go back into this world that John Scalzi has created. Like I said, I know I wanted to read more of him after that first book because I'm like, there's so much that I like about your writing, dude. I just wasn't quite dialed into the plot as much as I should have been. And like I said, I like to play devil's advocate as far as the mystery thriller aspect goes in this. But I do think it was a really solid sci-fi crossover book. I agree. I think it does a really good job of... Scalzi definitely, in some ways, missed his calling as a mystery writer. I guess he didn't miss it because he's writing mystery novels. But I think that he's really good, and I think that it's really fun to read his take on that genre within a really interesting concept in science fiction. So, Scott, out of five cats named Donut... Five donuts, but not but not the edible kind. Yeah. How many donuts out of five would you give this novel? Yeah, we're skipping. Sometimes we do five, sometimes we do ten. Get over it. Well, <laughs> to score this, I had to consider what this book is meant to be. Um, near future sci-fi, check. It's a really cool concept, and it makes a really deceptively deep exploration into the social, legal, and political effects of its main conceit, procedural drama. Check. It's a well-crafted police mystery with solid investigation, action, and character work. The only knock I have against head-on is the ending. It's really abrupt, right? It is pretty darn abrupt. Uh, It's kind of akin to Jessica Fletcher just explaining who the culprit is and then the end. That's the end of the episode. There's nothing else. It's kind of like Perot without the final monologue. It's just, oh, this is what happened and, and it's over. Yeah. 
So because of that, I'm docking it a half of a donut. I, I don't really want to think about cutting a donut in half, but I'm giving it four and a half cats named donut out of five. I love it. And also, yes, big shout out to Hercule Perot, good friend of mine. Thank you for bringing him up. I'm going to give this three donuts out of five. This was a, a fun read for me. It's not going to incredibly stick with me, but I really enjoy being in this world and I'm going to go back. Kind of the best way I can put it. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight for Science Fiction Night at John Scalzi Revisited, whatever you'd like to call it. We appreciate you always hanging out with us. Remember, we're on social media and we love to talk to you guys. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram. You can drop by our website, whatever you want to do. And if you have any suggestions for books you want us to read, send us an email at podcast at genrejunkies.com. Yeah, why not? We'd love to hear it. All right, Scott, thank you for being with me tonight, as always. And thank you, Sandra, for having me, as always. So everybody hug your cats tight and keep reading past your bedtime. (laughs) 